Good evening. Good evening. Guess what? It is a Thursday again. Yes, it is another Thursday. And of course, we are here again live and direct. And of course, another exciting chat about track and field business, everything track and field. And um, before we get into the program, uh, before I introduce my guest, I want to wish someone a happy, happy birthday. I have a very special viewer or supporter who is having a birthday. And um, she's not just a supporter, but a very outstanding Olympian, three times Olympian. Ruth William Simpson is having a birthday today. Happy, happy birthday, Olympian Ruth William Simpson. And um, as I said before, she's a three times Olympian, 1972, 1976, and 1980. And please, guys, give her a warm, please to show her some love um, tonight because I'm sure she'll be here later on on the program. So with that said, welcome wherever in the world you are. And my guest tonight is it's not an athlete it's not a track and field coach it is actually a track and field fanatic like myself and his name is Xavier and tonight we are just going to be talking about the business of track and field um, just to break it down, we will be talking about the fundamentals of management where we will be looking at um, planning, organizing, leading and evaluating, which are the four main components of management. So I'm not going to do any more talking. I'm going to bring Xavier in now who will be, you know, we'll just be chatting with you guys and you know, just giving you some of the information that we, you know, that we have in our mind or in our head. So with that said, help me welcome Xavier Duncan. Xavier, welcome to HP Chat Track. And as I told told them, we will be talking tonight about the, the business of track and field and you know, just the business side of things. So, Xavier, before we get into business, um, I just want you to tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, where you're from, the, which part of Jamaica you're from, which school you went to, and, you know, if you did any sport, any at all, welcome, Xavier. Ah, thank you very much, HP. Thank you. Thank you for having me on your show tonight. Um, good night, everyone. Good night to the viewing public. Um, I could go on and on telling persons who I am, but in a, in a, in a short, I am originally from Portland. I ventured into track and field a little bit, didn't get successful. I went to Titchfield High School for a little bit. I went to Kingston College for a little bit. Not even a little bit, but for four years, I went on to the University of Technology. I then went on to Excelsior Community College where I gained my bachelor's in finance and management. Um, I presently live in the United States where I just finished my master's in business administration. Um, Sports-wise, I am um, a national representative or a past national representative of Jamaica Field Hockey. Um, I'm a lover of track and field. I love pretty much every sport. I pay attention mostly to track and field because it's my first love. And I love the business side of it. Okay, so. Xavier, I have a question for you, and I'm burning to ask you this question. Did you compete at Boys Champs for Kingston College? And if I hear no, I'm going to be disappointed. HP, I'm going to be honest, no. How could, um, you, how could you go to Kingston College and not do any sport? 
Um, Specifically track no, and field. No, I, I, I played field hockey for Kingston College. Track and field, track season. Um, to be honest, track, track and field took a lot out and I was more catered, more leaning towards my education back then. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be honest, managing time then wasn't was very critical and I pay more attention to my book side than my sporting side. So um, track and field wasn't on the table any at all. Okay. 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 Um, you mentioned earlier um, that you completed a master's degree. Tell me a little bit about your major or special skills in that, um, in your degree. Uh, all right. So, so um, my master's is a, a general concentration because I want to stay general so I can branch off in anything that I wanted wanted to do. Um, I, I lean to project management. My, my, my concentration was in project management because that's the part that I really like much out of everything else. Um, I like to connect the dots. I am the connector of dots. I can find you the solution. Once you give me the problem, I, the only, sol there's a few solutions that are not there and I'm not eager to find them is how to get to heaven and hell. So, and we know okay. how, how that part, so, but any other solutions I'll be able to get you. I, I wouldn't tell you no, because there's always a solution. Indeed. Indeed. Before we get into the meat of the matter, um, let me just say a welcome to everyone joining us from, um, on Facebook and YouTube. And, um, Latoya have me cracking up. Latoya said, it never so <laughs> Him never succeed at track. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Latoya. Welcome, Monica. Monica Lewis, Latoya, joining us early. Welcome, guys. Xavier, let us get into serious business. Um, we're here tonight to look at the fundamentals of management, which the four core functions of management are planning, organizing, leading and evaluating sport management is a handling uh, is handling the affairs of uh, sport that involves a combination of skills um, corresponding with the fundamentals that i just mentioned it and um, it involves managing an organization with you know staff athletes different activity equipment, facility, and the list goes on. Your thoughts on what um, management means in the world of sports? Um, it's just like any other organization. Um, management is the driving force. It, it determines success. Um, so if I'm supposed to say management in sports compared to management in even say an airline it's pretty much the same thing because when you go into an airline used airline industry you still talk about planning organizing leading and evaluating as you said um so when you get to sports is i call it transferable skills it's the same thing but it's how you manipulate the knowledge that you have to make make it work in that sector i in my opinion um not even my opinion but manage to manage a sport um to manage any organization as you see how important is formal training meaning you go to school you do a degree you do a certificate that kind of thing how important is formal training to lead an organization the to be honest it really depends on which era you're from and and that's where I'm but does it really because... matter which era you're from though isn't it as you said before managing an organization where you manage people and whatever resources you have? I, I can I can run a scenario. Um, you can use both of us. Um, you have the masters, I have the experience, years of experience. Years of experience for me will chump most of the times over your masters, but when you combine the both, that's where the synergy comes along. So it depends on how you want to run your organization. You can run it from a theory perspective or you can run it from a people perspective. I would say qualitative and quantitative, depending on who you want to do it. 
Because if I can manage people very well and never been to any formal institution and you've been to, you have gone through the, the high school, you have gone through the colleges, you have reached to your master's and you're realizing that Xavier Club is making more money than HB Club. Then you start to dissect, why is that? So even though you're like formal education and experience, you have to decide how, how you want to bridge the gap because it's a mixture of both. It's not just formal education. Formal education will get you nowhere. To be honest, it will get you know, a lot. You can. I think people. I think people will hear that and disagree. But I understand exactly what you're saying. You have so many people out there with experience, but with that experience that you have in a certain field, how important is passion with that experience mm -hmm. that you have or that mm -hmm. formal training that you have in order to run a successful? Um, organization and we're going to stick to sport preferably okay. track and field how important is the four main functions of uh, management planning organizing leading and evaluating how important are those functions in um, in order to run a successful organization to be honest HP, we'll be talking for hours if we if we try to dissect it but let us keep it simple um you said passion. Um, my theory is that if you don't enjoy what you do, it's going to be hard work. It's going to be very difficult. So the moment you're not enjoying what you do, I I think it's you're two steps behind because then you're you're struggling to get up in the morning. But if you have that passion and drive to do what you do, it's it's it seems like you're having fun doing it, and that that plays a big part in how successful your club or your organization will be is the passion. Because as you said, there are certain things that you can quantify and see how it's successful, how it may make people successful. But you know it's you know it's a passion why this person is successful, but you can't put it on paper. You only can say, I know know this, but I can't have a theory to say this is the reason why. Um, when we talk about planning, organizing, leading, and evaluating, we start track and field. You have to plan from the basic. We start in a club, you're going to plan. You need to make your, I call it smart. You have a smart plan. You have to have it. You got to be specific. You got It has to be measurable, achievable, and what we said, relevant and time-bound. So it it it. This is where the theory comes in now because persons with experience will be all over the place. But then the theory comes in and start to formalize everything in a format that makes sense to people. And you can, people can start visualizing what it is. So I'm going to go back to my original question. How important is formal training when you're leading an organization? So as you just said, it is is important because when it comes on to the meat of the matter now where you're going to be putting these functions into practice you need to have someone that understand the fundamentals because you can understand the practical a lot of us can hear that okay put this over there and it will turn into this but as it relates to the fundamentals and now we're going to break down the four main functions we're going to look at each one and how important they are okay planning we're looking at planning first because planning is the first one the second is organized so planning involves this the designing of the decision making you agree right definitely Okay, this is where managers or the head of departments establish organizational goals. So you have to, so what is your goal? And you create a course of action to achieve them. Management make strategic decisions to set a direction for the organization. Managers also brainstorm different alternatives in order 
to achieve these objectives by choosing a course of action. Now, my question is, based on your formal training in management and your exposure to sport management, is the planning phase being ignored? Um, depends. <laughs> I'm, tonight, I'm going to be try to be very political. Like correct. Um, there well, fit, there, well, what we want to put out there is we. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Right, I'll leave that me, one. Go ahead. Let, let, let me tell you. Um, sometimes I sit and wonder if anybody has formal training because it seems like they're they're missing. They're missing missing. It, you see how simply you put it. You see how you put it into. The perspective on people are like, okay, if we do all of this, it should be working. So that's why I'm telling you, based on the era that you're coming from, and this is the difference of HP making a dollar and Xavier being a millionaire. So what's going to happen is that you are from an era that you know the, you know what you're doing, but then time has changed. Things have evolved and people not putting into place, putting things into place, what is needed. And this is where now, am I not contradicting, but this is where you try to bridge a gap between what you know then and formal education. Because if you bridge a gap with formal education and the experience, everything you touch will turn goal. And... I will use I will use one athlete as an example, and a lot of people don't pay attention to it. Usain Bolt made money not because he ran fast. Usain Bolt made money because the person behind him knew the formal way of doing stuff and what is what is needed for him to make money. Usain Bolt is not the first person that ran fast. Usain Bolt is not the first person that have broken records, mm-hmm. but the persons before never capitalized on making money. So you start bridging the gap based on where you're at in life now, and based before on what you, before you go that any, we're in. before you go any further, Howard Tomlinson and I and I'm going to agree with him. Howard is saying, um, irrespective of the of the era, nothing is supposed to change and i agree with him it doesn't matter if you did it in the 60s in the 50s in the 80s or the 21st century the fundamentals remains the same your thoughts i will beg to disagree with award and maybe with you hb is that um we do not if i use I will say I'll use, we do it in the reverse in that we will give persons, and we're talking about Jamaica as part of our analysis now. We used to, or we still do give persons based on years of experience and not qualification. And people tell you, because you know how to do it, I'll give you the job. And that was the era that we're coming from. Now the era has changed that persons with the masters and the PhD are going into these industries and making a difference because the stuff that the person before in the 60s that couldn't put on the paper that A plus B plus C, the person is writing it down now and make it, as you said, formalizing it to make it work. But the fundamentals have not changed. The fundamental has not changed, but then the applications of the fundamental is what is important. Persons before weren't applying what we consider fundamentals. We are just doing. because Because of the lack of formal training. Think about it. (laughs) The lack of formal training. I will agree with that. The lack of formal training. um, But I believe in lifelong learning. And you, you're supposed to be changing with time. Been doing a lot of reading about it. And you realize that things and time change. You realize the sport, track and field has changed so much that 
we I've seen you done interviews and we talk about the 400 meter and the long distance and Jamaica will never get better because we're not willing to change. And that comes in planning. You understand? And I'm That's glad, fundamental I'm glad, planning. I'm glad you say that, Xavier. And we're now going to segue into the first um function of management planning let us look in planning you have three main components strategic planning tactical plan operational planning let us look at strategic planning and then i'll ask you to comment strategic planning is a long term planning three let's call it three years or more an example that we could use for a long-term plan would be, let's say, the Paris Olympics is coming up. All right, let's use that. The example for the long-term planning could be, let's say, we the, the objective is to win 10 gold medals in Paris. Listen now, 10 gold medals to win in Paris. How important is long-term planning to achieve an organization goals. 10 gold medal in Paris. Mm -hmm. If that wasn't planned five years ago, or maybe two or three years ago for Paris, it will not happen. That there, 10 gold medal will, will not happen. And this is why planning is very important. So our strategic planning would have started, let's say, from let's say during the pandemic when people were working from home and we weren't interacting with anybody paris we would have started planning let's say for paris even after tokyo then which was three years ago that years would, ago. right so that would have been our um strategic planning because we want to win 10 gold medals all right tactical planning now tactical planning is a short term plan to um of an objective that you can do over a year let's call it a year a year or less and uh, the example that i have for a tactical planning is a marketing campaign for paris so that marketing campaign you would um create a buzz around the paris olympics you would create a slogan you would create a theme song you would create a logo because a tactical plan is a plan that will help you to achieve your long-term plan again your thoughts on promoting the olympics aggressively and you know where i'm going in azizia you know where I, I'm going. H, 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 I know where you're going um and as I tell you, my concentration again? is in project management. Um, yes. Again, I'll tell I'll tell you again. This is for Jamaica, we have none. There's 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 zero tactical planning any at all. Um and the time frame that you're using is that our strategic plan would be after Tokyo, right? Which is four years. Tactical would be after world championship because you have stuff going on before so it would would be 16 months and then the operational plan is within that 16 months going up to the games right so the operational plan would be the action that you use the tactical plan to accomplish the strategic plan how and, important are those elements in order to achieve the organization organization's goal you you ever build a house and you dig the foundation and you forget to put in the steel it just get all crumbled down mm -hmm. when when if there's an earthquake it's the foundation is not set and planning is the foundation of any organization and you list this the three three phases of planning which makes it will make sense if if, if it's done correctly, but if if you miss the steps, the only thing the only thing, for example, that save us from from that highlighting this even with our track and field organizations that we have in Jamaica is that we have superstars, and that's my notion. Our superstars have been doing so good that we forget that these little 
not even little. These major stuff that need to have been done have not been done. And whenever we start taking a close look and dissecting it, we realize that there's so much that can be done. And I'm going to go back to my original question. How important is you know, formal formal training you know, you know, when you're heading an organization? All right, HB. All right. As Howard said, every management course that one attend is even told is the same. I agree with you. Every Basically you read, the same. No, yes. No, 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 no matter what edition, it's going to be the same mm -hmm. theories behind of it and the same process. It's all it's how it's applied and how persons apply it. So it it it's not the theories are the that's this that's the issue is the applications of the theories by people within the organization. So formal training in in this sense now, based on what the argument segue to is that without formal tra training, we're we're two or three steps back because we do not know to utilize the resources that we have. And that plays a big part in it. And if you notice, um, what I used for our example was very, I kept it in track and field, and it was very simple. You use those three, and if you, I'm going to say something, and maybe people will disagree with me. I was going to say a lot of time without formal training, you you're not going to know about your area in depth. So someone can come and say, okay, I know how to build a house. You understand? I know how to, hit, to build a house. But what do you know about that house? Do you know that, okay, first of all, you have to put your house on paper. You have to put the plan on paper. Then you have to, you have an idea how much material you're going to need um, digging your foundation. When you dig your foundation, you know that you need steel, you need blocks, you need cement, you need all of those elements to hold that house together. So after a year or a few months, everything doesn't come falling down. And I use 10 gold medals in Paris as our long-term plan. And the tactical plan, I use a marketing campaign for the Olympics to accomplish that. And further down on my campaign, I have a marketing campaign called, um, I even have a slogan, the slogan called Team Jamaica Drift into Paris. You know, create a buzz around it. Let everywhere people turn, they hear about this. Team Jamaica Drift into Paris. You come up with a theme song. We have so many great writers, musicians. Put a song together. Ask Usain Bolt and his team to put a song together. You know, promote our trials, Olympic trials, but, aggressively. But, 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 go ahead. But HP, before you even go any further, um, I guess that it depends on what their their goals are and their vision of, of, of what they're doing. So it, it tends to, it's, it tends to move away from what we expect because they might have their plans and know what they want. But um, in general concept, it makes sense what we're talking about. And people say, this makes sense why it's not been done. But then a counter argument is that our plan is five gold medal. We don't have the budget to to run a marketing campaign, and it no. doesn't make it doesn't make sense because Brand Jamaica sells itself. Xavier, Xavier, I plan. A lot of people when they hear, and I want you to read. I want you to look at that comment from Howard, and it is basically what we're saying. But I have planned a five k, a five k run in the winter in America without a budget. I was asked to, f I, I don't know. I think people, when they hear that you're from Jamaica, you know everything about track and field. Once they hear that you're from Jamaica, they think that you know everything about track and field. I was asked to plan a 5K race and I wasn't given a dollar. And it was successful and we had a big turnout. 
So you don't have to have a lot of money. Social media right now is, I use social media and in-house advertising to promote that 5K event. And I walk and I beg people in the community. I print, I design a flyer and I go to every store in the community and ask them. I told them it's a charity event and I ask them if I can put the flyer in their establishment and they say yes. So there are creative ways to run a marketing campaign without even a dollar. I'm not saying you're not going to need some money, but the amount of money that you think you're going to need, it is about create being creative. We have so many social media platforms. Your thoughts? I see you're burning to say something. Um, I could, in, in 60 seconds, and I call it the 60 seconds review, I could plan, execute, and tell them and and even have an evaluation set up for for any organization how to make it work and and you're right formal education with my passion with the experience that i've garnered over the years it's it it makes sense because as you said and let me plan let me plan it for you 10 gold medals 10 gold medals paris olympic we know that is happening we know the time is coming we know how to maneuver. We know when we want to start to market the product. We can use our own athletes to market the product. We use events in between Paris to be a launch, launching pad for this marketing campaign. As you said, no money, zero budget. I love working with zero budget because then anything else is a bonus. Um, Brand Jamaica kind of sells itself. As you said, you're saying Bolt and his team is in music. They, it's it's an idea. You have to have vision because if I say I need 10 gold medals in Paris Olympic, I'm going to ask every company in Jamaica, be a part of this vision. We're going to Paris. We know we're going to Paris. You understand? That's not that's a given. We're going to Paris. Past events have taught us that it's going to be great and it's getting better and better. So it's easy to sell itself. So you, we don't, as you said, we don't need a dollar to do anything because the product is already there and we can market, it will market itself if you, if you put everything in place. This is my marketing plan. I'm going to say it again in case anybody affiliated is watching this is my if i was asked to do a marketing plan for paris this is my marketing plan one i'm going to create a logo the organization has access to our athletes images from 1948 to date that's one create a logo number two create a slogan um, the slogan that I have team Jamaica drifting to Paris everybody is drifting this day these days you understand? Create a buzz around that. The next thing, create a theme song. The next thing, promote the Olympic trials aggressively to get people to fold the stadium the three or four days of trials so we can generate additional revenue to make sure that when our athletes go to Paris, they are treated royally. The next thing, use retired and current athletes to fuel the campaign you understand that would be the main component of my campaign to paris and my campaign would have started already people would have tired to but, see it on, on on social media and as vivian marana is saying if we fail to plan we plan to fail your thoughts um i agree with you um i just think you missed out one part of it um, a part of track and field business that we're missing out is that the, the audience, the wider audience is missing out. Where you said you want to f fill the stadium. I, I, I don't want to fill the stadium anymore because that doesn't bring revenue into the 
it, that doesn't bring enough revenue into the sports. No, right but now. we need that. That's a part of the revenue. Gate receipt is very important. We need that. And one of the main reasons why we need that, and I have it right here, is this will psychologically boost our athletes to do well because they see that the entire country is behind them. So we need every little bit in order to um, accomplish our goal. So we need that's, the fans in the stadium. That's maybe where I differ with you with when it comes on, because my part of my plan when it comes on to the business at track and field is that I want to change the whole atmosphere of what track and field is. Um, when I compare track and field to any other sport, and I've been I've been trying to figure out why every other sport pays so much, and we're 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 getting to the pay part of it because that part of the business um, is that I am not going to, and I'm going to be honest. I I prefer to stay home and watch a replay on TV because I'm paying my money to see uh, Elaine Thompson or Shelly and to run. And I'm only going to see them for 10, min 10, 10 seconds. After that, my money gone down the drain. While if, if I can create a buzz for viewership that makes it more likable and create that atmosphere for viewership and TV rights to pull more money in, I think my TV rights will bring you more money than get receipts. And then the athletes will benefit a little bit more. And then we're talking about the, the wider scope. I've been here when trials, a couple of years back, when trials kept every TV station has sent a representative just to see our trials because it's the only place that you have seen so many superstars all at once. And but that was the golden era. The golden era is that we had so many persons around the world just want to see these persons run. And we can't, we're, we're taking it for granted in Jamaica that they are just normal persons. Where every other country that you go, you go to Europe, Europe will fold the stadium, gate receipts will pay you saying, or gate receipts will pay a Elaine or pay a Shakari because these persons are wanting to see these superstars. Jamaica, it's not that, it's not that simple. You, you could, Reggae girls came home and the stadium was empty. Reggae boys playing in the stadium, it's empty. But you just said, but you just said, Xavier, that you don't want to get people in the stadium. Why? Would no, I, I, because my TV rights will give you more money. No, but we still need the fan. Track and field is the only sport where you don't see stadium being filled to capacity, especially in... North America, especially on, on this side. When you look at other sport, have you ever look at um have you ever look at college football, NFL football? Have you ever look at their stadium? Uh, I, that I, is I looked, holding I over hundred over hundred thousand fans. But why would you uh, want fans to come? Would I, you I, hold I, on? Let me ask I, you I, something. I Zavian, would you like to have an event and not have any stands in your stadium? If my money, if my TV rights money is more, and this is why, this is my theory behind of it, HB. Not saying that I don't want funds in the stadium right now. It was back down to planning. You see, our strategic planning, it's, it's out the door when it comes on to get people into that stadium. Track and field yeah, in North no America plan. is boring. Yeah, track and field in North America is boring. It's not a family event. Nothing do happen. You just go. I was reading an article. I should have caught the person. The person said they went to Haywood to Diamond League and they don't even know who is running. You understand? That's how bad it is in this atmosphere. But people pay money for TV rights. If you want money, and I'm talking money now. I want my fans in the stadium because the fans in the stadium is a different kind of energy. And as I said before, it is with everything else that you're getting. And maybe what you just said is the mindset that we have that, okay, I'm getting $15 million from this company, 20 from that company. If fans don't come in the stadium, it's no big deal. Our athletes want to see the stadium. But I'm going to go back to something that you said. Two nights ago, I was watching sports news 
and Zarnell Hughes, who competes for Great Britain, he went to his home country with one day one one medal a bronze a bronze medal and if you see the reception that he got from a country that he doesn't compete for and the reason why i'm saying this is that we are winning multiple medals and when our athletes come home we don't even know when our athletes come home we don't even know we don't even know that they're home and he, he won a bronze medal for another country and his home country rolled out the red carpet for him. It, it, and and it, it boils back down to, as you started off our conversation, is, is it boils down, back down to management and how management perceive and management vision. I don't... I, I, I do think what's happening with with the association or track and field within this hemisphere is that um, we don't have a vision to grow the sport to say to make it a household name in big in big in large countries. Um, part of it is that the U.S. struggles with track and field, and and I would put it up. 75,000 fans went to an NCAA volleyball game. Track and field has... Um, every race have a superstar. And we barely can get 10,000 persons. You, you know the- why? Because it goes back to what we were just talking about. Planning. There is no planning. And there is there's no campaign that we are not um, trying. We're not doing anything to entice people to come in we've seen other sport i mean ncaa sports when you look at their football when you look at their basketball when you look at volleyball and all those things and people turn out it's just that i personally don't think the powers that be is aggressively promoting track and field I don't think we're aggressively promoting track and field. There's no way that you should have so many superstars in your country in one stadium over a weekend and you cannot pull the stadium, not even one time. Can I ask you a question, question, H3? Sure. And this is how serious it is. When is trials? Trials is uh, um, <laughs> normally the end. You and I know because we are track and field fans. Uh, and, the and, ordinary person doesn't know. Trials is going to be either the last week in June or the first week in July. And, and that depending on when the championship and this is, is being held. This is, this is what... And we are it? now almost at the end of October. Next week is the end of October and this is why I decided to do this show about managing, managing an organization, whether it is sport, whether it is food, whatever you are doing, you must plan. The four core elements or functions of management must be a part. Planning, organizing, and we are going to go to organizing now, leading and evaluation. So let us segue now into organizing organizing include appropriate coordination between planning and resources i love it i'm going to read that one more time organizing is it includes the appropriate coordination between the planning and the resources that you have working. What this means is that how you distribute the resources and delegate the task to personnel to achieve the organization goals that you set up in the planning stage. I love this part. Your thoughts. How does one recruit the right fit when delegating task and again we're staying in sport uh, well for organizing for me it's it's a two part because organizing actually in my in my head it's 
it's it's it's bridging the gap because organizing actually comes before planning because a little bit of organizing has to be put in place before you start to plan because you can, and and this is where I think we're going wrong. We are planning with the with the wrong set of persons. So when it reaches to the stage of organizing, we really don't have no the tools but, in the shed. No, but when you put when you look at those two functions, you have to plan planning really comes before organizing okay because you have to sit first you have all right let's say we are forming a company you and i have to sit down and plan one what kind of company we are going to run two what are the resources we have three what are the objective of the organization that's the planning and when we figure out all of that now we start organizing all those things in order to accomplish what we're setting out to do. It's it's interchangeable because if both of us are not formally trained, as you said, started trying to start a company, the planning phase will have to be revisited when we start when we do when we do the organization. Because you're just throwing out people out there. Planning for me is is raw material. You just put the raw material there, and then when you reach the organization phase, you start to to put them where they're supposed to do. You start putting the pieces where they're supposed to fall. Um, so organizing, and we're talking about track and field, is we can't have the same person in a in in the same position for over two decades. In no job. Especially, no especially <laughs> as it relates to certain jobs, you need to be re rotating people. And, and 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 if the person is not, I, I'm not saying that the person is not a lifelong learner, but you over time you realize that the time has passed for these persons to move on, and that's part of planning, and that's part of organize organization organizing your the whole concept of it. So in in essence is that when you're organizing, you have to put the right place, right persons in the right position using the right resources. Resources are not limited. Persons with the, cor with the correct credentials are not limited. So if you can't able to have that vision to to put them in the right places or do what is necessary for it to work, we're going to have a fundamental problem. And I totally agree because organizing is, let me tell you, for me, running an organization is simple. If you understand planning, organizing, leading, and evaluating, because they're self-explanatory. It's easy, but the thing is that we complicate things because we ignore the fundamental and that's where um and that's where conflict of interest nepotism and all of these things take place because we refuse to adhere to what the fundamentals are asking us to do how do you find the right fit for me personally to find the right fit to do a job I have to see where you have some training in that area. And it does, and the training doesn't mean it has to be a degree or it has to be a bachelor's or a master's degree. I mean, it could be a certificate because in a certificate, with a certificate, you are able to understand the basic. You just want to understand the, the fundamentals and you put them um, into, into action. So... And the thing is that you cannot delegate the job for a doctor to a lawyer. You have to know that, okay, if I'm going to give you the job as a doctor, you have to have some amount of training to, uh, to employ you to be a doctor over here. You have to have some training to be a lawyer over here. You, you're in banking, Xavier. Xavier, you're in banking. Right, you're yeah, in right. banking because you did formal training in management, and I'm sure finance was a part and of finance. it. And finance was a part of it. Your thoughts, but but there's a thing called transfer. There, there's a thing called transferable skills. 
it's yes. me, and you mention it. Um, you, you, not necessarily because I'm from the banking sector doesn't mean I can't run a truck truck organization. Um, the skills from the banking sector will bring it's part of my asset or something that I bring to the table. But it's how much how will you utilize that skill that you have? And as you said, you can't have the rules for a lawyer go go for the same as a doctor. So you got to be able to compartmentalize how you manage people differently. And the thing is, you have to have a strong leader to lead. And we're getting to leading next. I don't want to get there before it, before you get there. But all right, before you go this, any further, before you go any further, read that comment on the screen from Howard. One of the biggest problem is that we have too too many profiles. People just want to be a part, but has no professional input. Everyone wants to be a manager, but cannot manage. Um, and this is this is where when I started, I said formal education does not mean much for me sometimes, because most of these persons that are profilers can read can their resumes from the best schools in the no, country. But and no, the but they have overseas. they have formal training, but in what? No, they do have formal training in a, but do they have formal training in the portfolio that you're going to assign to them? That is a problem that we're having. So a person might come with a master's degree in um, let's say um Our agriculture. Betty, say the person about no, a, a, a master's degree in agriculture, and you and they're, and they're the treasurer. And they, there you and go. The it right, it doesn't make sense. So when I say formal training, I mean that you should have some formal training in the capacity that I am oh. going to employ you gotcha. in. You know, because you have a lot of these people. Oh, I went to Harvard. I did a law degree here, and I did a, um, a PhD here and there and whatever. But do you have any formal training in managing people? understanding the fundamentals of and management the, the the thing is a thing that i've learned over the years is the hardest part of management is managing people that's a skill that's not that's not taught in any school that's something that you have to learn on your own um i've been in an industry that i f f for days i forget who i am because you change yourself to fit different personalities to fit different persons reactions and stuff so you sometimes you wonder what's really your identity as a manager but then it's managing people you lose yourself in managing people because you're you just keep going going to fit in to be able to manage a particular group um for me all of this what we're talking about ties into a particular type of leadership so once we're going when to comes, get to comes, we're going to get to that we're going to get to that but i want to comment before we get to that you said it's hard to manage people and for me it is very very easy to manage people you know how you can manage people and manage them easy easy policies and procedures that's all you need hb had a manager right and at a at a, at a country director and i would say can i can I get this favor, please? Like, can I leave early today? And she said, all right, how many are you in the office? I said, maybe seven or eight of us. And she's like, all right, if I say yes to you and the next person come and ask to leave early and say, yeah, I have to justify why you leave early. So you see, before she said yes to me, she's going to say no because policies and procedures trump everything else. She said, we, we go, we're going to follow the policies and procedures so I don't get into problem any at all. And that, <laughs> and that is the problem we're having. We write these policies and procedures, but are we following them? People, and when we pitch our plan individually, I am going to mention that companies or leaders or managers, they will write policies and procedures to govern the organization, but what they do, they manipulate it, those rules when it suits them and they get into problem. Remember, you know, even God wrote policies to manage us, you know, he wrote the 10 commandments. That's a policy and procedures to 
handle people. So it is handle very easy people. to manage people. Right, put it in writing. You put it in writing. If they refuse to adhere, look, let me tell you, I'm one of the nicest people you'll ever meet. But when it comes on to the boardroom, when it comes on to doing the job, I'm a totally different person. Because if the rule says this, it doesn't matter whether your friends or family, if you refuse to adhere to the rules, then we're going to have a problem. Because the minute you start manipulating the rules for one person That's and you don't do it for sure. you are going to run into problems so into it problem. is so it is easy to manage people you just have to put it in writing policies and procedures and it's done and and it goes back to the planning phase that's a part of your planning phase for your organization. How do you want your organization to look? How do you want your organization to be governed? You have to write some policies. You can't just bring in people in your organization and no policies and procedures. So if someone come and put something here, you cannot tell them not to put it there because you did. You don't have anything in writing. Any, anything in writing. And before you go any further... Um, uh, Odian is saying that he agrees with you when you said it's hard to manage people because he's saying you have to um, make adjustment to manage people. I don't think you need to. Once you put that thing in writing, you are no. Good. I, did, I, I disagree with you because um, even though you have policies and procedures, as a manager, you you'll be able to. I won't say bend the rules or you would say manipulate it. It's not about manipulating it, but you need to get full potential from somebody, your employee that you're working with. And in order to get full potential, get that full potential out of that person, there are certain things that you will have to, to, to fix in order. Say, say you all, you have all mothers in the, in your industry, parents, teachers, meeting now and they need to go you have to find a way to keep them happy the policies and procedures across the board can't work saying that nobody can leave work early you would have to sit it down and sit them down and say this week you go next week you will go and you rotate it you can't be off all on the all be off on the weekends you rotate the weekend so you gotta put stuff in place to be able to make sure you get full potential out of the persons you work with even though they are black and white to say that this is what's i'm going to, to give you i'm going to give you a scenario um a few years ago because i like to follow the rules and um a few years ago something happened at work i hope my former boss never see this interview but anyway um something happened and uh, I follow the rule to, because before I was a support analyst, IT support analyst, and something happened and I follow the rules to, to action the problem. Anyway, my boss, he came and he was upset and he said, you know, why did you do it this way? And I said to him at that time, when you're being employed, they give you a little book called Code of Ethics. So that little book is how the organization is run and everything. And I said to him, I follow the, follow the rules and action the problem. And he said, no, uh, the code of ethics is just a book with, with some rules. And I turned to him and said, but if I do not follow these rules, you are going to penalize me. And he did not say anything because he knew that I was right. Because you gave me a code of ethics book to say this is how you operate within the organization and i follow that rule and you still wanted to penalize me it is not going to work and he realized that i was right and he said okay hp you are right because the code of ethics mean that you the only way we are going to be able to manage people and manage them successfully is that you have to have some rules that govern your organization or else everybody's going to come and do their own thing. And if people well, come and start doing their... Out. Oh, yes, you must. And now we're going to lead in. Okay. Leading involves motivating the employees to achieve the organization 
goals. Leading yes. consists of mo motivating employees, influencing people's behavior to achieve organizational objectives. Leading focuses on managing people such as individuals, teams, groups, etc. Now, your thoughts on that. You said something earlier about changing the rules. If you change the rules for one, Xavier, and you will have to change it for all. What type of Agreed. leader are you? It depends on the situation. No. And it, it, no, it does. It does. Um, okay, okay. Because okay. It, 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 de it depends. As Awad said, it's called situational leadership. But then um, I, I, I will, I fell in love with, there, there are persons in throughout history that I, I admire because their leadership style just stand out for the wrong reasons. But at the end of the day- For the wrong reasons? It's, <laughs> for the wrong reasons. Okay, but they're okay. still leadership, but I won't mention the names, but there are still leadership styles that people still study, but won't use those names for examples, right? Which leadership style are they? Um, <laughs> one is autocratic. <laughs> but it depends on the situation. Our, but then for me, leadership, leadership is an integral part of any organization. You must have a strong leader depending, no matter what, your leader must always lead from the front, must be able to, I'll use the word and people might disagree with me. You must be able to manipulate a situation to make it work using the rules and regulations of that governs that organization. Because it's, it's, it's pretty, it boils down to manipulations. Because I have to be able to motivate you, HP, to move to move the chair from point A to point B, and then move it back from point B to point A when you're done. I must sell you a story to make it sound really good for you to want to do it every day. Even if you don't want to come to work, you're like, Zavan, I'm still coming. Do you need me to move the chair any further? That's would you one. would you Zavian Duncan work with an autocratic leader? It, that leader would get himself in trouble. No, but you said that you admire that lead. Hold on, let me tell the people what autocratic leadership is. I'm just going to sum it up in in one mini little stadium. Autocratic leadership is my way or the highway. That's the bottom line. HB, That's the bottom I've line. With I've do worked as with I autocratic say, leadership. Do as I tell you. That would not work in this day and age. You have to HB. be a little bit of democratic, laser fair, transformational leadership. And we're going to tell the audience what each one of them is. But autocratic, Xavier, you would work with an autocratic leader who is going to tell you to move something there even though you know it's wrong you cannot say okay boss i think if we move it there the company is going to crumble so let us move it in the other direction you you just change the concept because you said it's wrong with autocratic no i didn't say it's that... wrong i didn't no. say it wrong i said i said autocratic is my way or the highway so your staff has no say in anything well being an autocratic leader, you have to be brilliant. You want to know why? Because you're going to, at some point in time, you're going to need to do that yourself. Because when you tell somebody to do it, they might just walk away. An autocratic leader bully because they can do it. When you tell me to do it and I know you might push back, I'll say, I'll do it myself. So autocratic leaders are not just regular person. Autocratic name me, leaders are one of those. Name, name me one company where only the leader alone is working in that company. If you can name me a company right now, an organization right no, now where not, only not, the autocratic not, leader is is running that company, then you know, name it. No company J, has J, only J, one. J, 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 J. 
J3 doesn't have one person running it. J3 doesn't have one okay. person running that okay. organization. No, it's 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 not about running the organization, but making the decisions. No, it's, but it's, one person. Listen, there is no suck. I cannot think of a successful company where only the owner, the founder alone is making all the decision. They have a board, they have a management team, and I'm sure when yeah, all but, these but you're missing you're missing part of it is that even though they have a board and have a management team, the decisions, the final autocratic for me is that the final decision comes on my board, on my table. So even if the board decides I'm going to buy that car, if I decide not to agree with the board, the final decision for me, that's what dictates you being autocratic or not, because the final decision is always yours. Even if it was a nine to one vote and you know it's a nine to one vote, because you're autocratic leader, and it's not what is in favor, you're still going to do it. So you still have, you still have your supporting staff, but how successful is that company? Means... How, how successful is, is the, that company though? How many companies do you have like that? That I mean, I know we it's, don't have any there, data, there, there, but there's not many though. There's not not many, many because yeah. what is going to happen after a while, your staff, they're going to be so demotivated that your your turnover is going to be so high. No, your turnover is high. It's it's not one of the lead, it's not one of the leadership style that anybody should want to aspire to in this day and age. But didn't it, you say you like it? No, I like it for more than one reasons. I do like it for more than one reasons. But then that's just a part of it, though. All right, let us just tell give the audience a little bit about a few leadership style and um, what they mean for those who are not sure. Um, as we said before, autocratic is basically do as I say. What if I tell you to do? You have no objection. The final decision is mine. So in other way, my way or the highway. And that's a very famous saying, um, my way or the highway. Um, democratic leader. Now, I'm a democratic leader. I'm, I'm three leaders in one. I'm a democratic leader, which is also known as participative leadership. The, the democratic leadership approach involves gathering input from everybody or the subordinates or a team, and everyone has a chance to contribute to making the decision. So I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm a little democratic because really and truly, I don't like to micromanage people. If I give you a portfolio, I expect you to come to me and said, look, this is where I am and da, 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 what do you think? So I'm not going to be micromanaging you. I'm not going to be doing the research for you. So I'm a little democratic. Laser fear, a lot of people, kind of misinterpret laser fear, but laser fear doesn't mean that you don't care. Laser fear leadership um, is, is not who cares. It's not a, not a do not care attitude, but it is the approach rather that involves empowering your employees, being hands-on. So you get your employees involved and you bounce ideas off them. So there's no micromanagement there. And also transformational leadership um, that involves developing a grand vision and rallying your team Rallying your team around it on the style, under this style, teams are eager to get involved. So I am a little of democratic, laser fair, transformational, because I love to have meetings and hear people tell me what they think about my idea. So if I come up with an idea, I, I love a boardroom. I love boardroom with a big table and a lot of chairs so that people can come in and we sit and we talk about the ideas and do it together. And then each person get their portfolio and go and do great things. And then we put it together and said, we did this. Your thoughts on those um, management style? Um, management styles plays a big part in organizations. Um, you have to have a mixture of all four depending on the situation, because sometimes it's just your way or, or the highway. And then 
as you said, laser fair, you have to empower your team to grow because you're not going to be in that organization forever. Um, a lot of people, and I can use what I've seen with track and field Jamaica is that a lot of people don't share that knowledge or willing enough to teach persons to move up into ranks in, in, in different positions, which is, which is not good for the sport because they pretend that they're going to be there forever. So it's, it's adopting different leadership styles for different situations. And I think going through the phases of managing, we are realizing that a few fundamental issues that we're having with track and field is that our leaders are not able Leading. to. <laughs> You're right. I, I, was, I wasn't, I wasn't going to put it out there like that, but our, our leaders are not able to manipulate the situations that they're placed in, are not able to command that respect or command that I would say command that respect for people to understand what is required. Okay. All right. Um, personally, you know, people, when I say life is simple, people disagree with me a lot until I break it down. Life is very simple. We complicate things because if you're put in a position to lead, just lead, no man. If you put in a position to plan, just plan, no man. So now we're going to be talking about evaluating, which is number four. Evaluating involves controlling and monitoring the overall process of evaluating and executing the plan by making adjustments to ensure that the organization goals are met. For example, and this example that I use, I use it because of how I feel. One of the things that you would evaluate, all right, let's say the four by 100 meter that we lost. We would have to sit down, my team would have to sit down and we identify and analyze the strength and the weakness. Why did we lose that relay? What was the threat? Because this is where your SWOT analysis come in. Your SWOT, the strength, weaknesses, and I mean, all of opportunities. Right, and opportunities. So how important is post season assessment of your team post mortem if you uh, want to call it a post mortem all right so um i'll first go back to the first first part of it because if you if you're going by this outline from this from the get go when you're planning part of the planning is that we will have an evaluation that will be stated clearly from day one. Whatever you do, a report must be submitted. A evaluation must be submitted. We must grade you on your performance. It can't just not happen. So when we get to the evaluation stage, it's, it's just like the icing on the cake because we've been working through all the phases where we need to go and just tell what happened because without evaluation you can't improve you won't you get can't. better you'll be exactly. you'll be stuck in the same cycle so evaluation for me is one of the critical part of this cycle in that without that evaluation and running back a SWOT, running your SWOT analysis all over again in reverse and to see what can you do better for next season. And I think over the years, we, are, we should have been, I said we, we should have won 21 medals at world championships. And so people knock me for it. But then if an analysis was done, an evaluation was done from the golden era, we should have always be at 15. 
15 would always be the benchmark because we have already set the platform. We all, would have already evaluate the situation, not because you fail. And this is what people tend to not understand. Even if you win, I still need an evaluation because I need to know what I need to do better. In order to continue winning. Because there's always an opportunity. You always, there's always an opportunity to get better. So not because you did terribly, terrible, you're going to say, I need evaluation. No, we had a good season. I still need my evaluation on the decks. We're because still going you in the need to ment- Right. <laughs> because you need to We're maintain to that momentum. Last year, we lost the four by one at the world championship last year in Eugene. This year, we came back and we lost it again. Do you think an evaluation was done last year after we lost that relay to identify where the weaknesses and the threats were? That that loss wasn't even from an evaluation of last year. Lack of evaluation. It's a lack of planning. (laughs) Yeah, it comes down to it comes down to all four Four, functions. We did not plan, we did not lead, and we did not evaluate. Because if your team goes out to play and you had a super team, let's say you're the team to beat and you lost last year and you come back this year with, with, with almost that same team and lose again, it means that no post-mortem or the post-mortem was not done properly. And even if, the thing is, it's it's too for me um, for for a national association, everything is too tight lipped. I think you should make it public. It should be public knowledge of what goes on. Not, not everything. Some things are confidential, but stuff things that can be made public, you need to put it out there to be public. As you said, we have to change the way we do stuff to get better. And evaluating evaluating is the key to doing that right now. Before Eval- you go on, just, the last pause, 10 years. Just, pause, just pause a little, Xavier, and let me read something that yeah. Jermaine Forrester wrote. He said, have you ever seen a championship report from any team in any sport in Jamaica? He said the USA USA track and field does one every year and it's given to the various coaches. That's why they that is why they never make the same mistake. They do post mortems, they write reports, they have to. I've never seen one. I all right. I didn't I I, I was part of a national team. Um we might not have put it on paper, but when I came back from my from from our tour, we sat down as a team and we spoke. We spoke about what we have learned, what we're trying to improve over the next couple of years. Um, we we made plans and we tried to work on them. Individual plans, team plans, and everything like that. I've seen teams that have done it. But my question is to Jermaine is that our problem is that we are not requesting it from JGA. We are not telling them that we need an evaluation. We... No, but should do we have to say we need one? Isn't it a part of the management? And then, Isn't and then, it they... a part of managing. And if, and if, quote unquote, as we said, it should be a part of management. But they answer to somebody, and the per, the, the persons they answer to is us. And if we request every sport, we we as or bloggers, we evaluate every event, every race, piece by piece, live. And we go through it and we say what we could do better. But we are not the powers. We are not no, the persons but, in high places. Yeah, but what the point I'm trying to make is that if you are a manager and you understand the functions of management, 
I should not have to ask you for that report. That report should be a part of the evaluation. The evaluation is actually you doing the report at the end of the season or the end of a championship or whatever we want to call it. So you as a manager should say, okay, where is the evaluation report? Let us now look at the strength and the weaknesses, what we need to fix for next year. What do, what do we need to fix for Paris going into Paris? It, it it boils down to formal training, as you said. Okay. So with that said, with us looking, with <laughs> us, and the thing is, you know, I like to use information. I like to use data. With us looking at the four functions of management, how important, I'm going back to the original question that I asked from earlier, how important is formal training if you are leading an organization? It, it has to be important. It is important um, to where we at in, See, in the Germany, sport. It is excuse me, one minute. Germany is saying the same thing. We don't need to tell them um, that we need an evaluation report. This is something that they should know. You're running an organization. HP, we're 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 we're, we're in a society. And unfortunately, we're in a society that sometimes we need to ask even the Minister of Finance the, the supporting documents for his budget because they don't feel the need to give, give the people what they want and we put them in power. The I government will do certain stuff and, and we have to block road and put up placard and, and everything to get a result and that shouldn't and we, be the case and that and that should not be management. that should not be the case you know that should not be the case if you say you are a manager and you understand that we have to sit down and plan we have to sit down and organize we have to sit down we have to lead and we also have to evaluate at a championship when i go on that website and i click and i click for a report i should be seeing a report okay report for budapest and I can go in and read that report and see the evaluation, see where we made the mistake and what we need to fix. What we're we're going to go into Paris with the same with the same thing. And then when we go there and not um and not compete to expectations, then what are we going to say? HB, I, I'm from an industry for I know I know like the back of my hand. I can sleep and tell you how it works. Paris is happening in August, right? And I was looking tickets to go into Paris. And this is personal. Paris ticket was $500 when I, I wanted to book to go into Paris. When I started looking 16 months ago, because I looked for dates to Paris. Jamaica will have a contingency of almost 60 persons, quote unquote, roughly, going into Paris. Have they booked a ticket? Have they approached an airline to say, I have this amount of person going into Paris. Can we book the ticket from early so we can save money? I am I'm sure that have not done been done. And if if they're gonna tell me that you, you don't know who make the team, you have not done your homework. Do a group booking, leave it blank. I need 40 seats at five hundred dollars. Whenever I make the team, the airline will make the adjustments. That's group booking. You understand? These are the little things that I'm annoyed with last minute. Nobody has tickets too expensive. We have to route them through this route. I don't need names to make, to, to put stuff in place because it will happen. I don't know. I don't know if we realize that, um, track and field Jamaica is a big deal. I don't think we realize it. Others realize it, but I don't think we realize that track and field Jamaica is a big deal. When we line up in certain events, we are the team to beat. When we line up in the women's four by one, we are the team to beat. When we line up in the women's 100, we are the team to beat. When we line up in the women's 200, Jamaica is the team to beat. So why HB, is it that we are not recognizing that we are a big deal? HB, the persons who recognize that we're a big deal is, is the major sponsors. The Adidas and the Nike and the Puma makes more money than brand Jamaica when it comes on to these championships. And that's the bottom line. Because I'm wearing, I am wearing Puma 
into championship knowing the product that I have, Puma should be paying me money. More money. And and something went out the other day, and this is business of track and field, which I I tend to talk about. And this is where planning and everything come into place and making deals that facilitate. If you don't plan properly, we will lose everything else because all these organizations are planning effectively and efficiently and making billions while we are just here not doing anything. I need to see a campaign. Our campaign need to start now. And as I said before, I'm giving them a head start. My, I've come up with a campaign for Paris. Team Jamaica drift into Paris or drifting into Paris, whichever term they want to use. Come up with a theme song, just like how we came up with the Reggae Boys theme song back in 1997. Come up with a theme song, a slogan, Team Jamaica drifting into Paris. Come up with something, use our current and retired athletes to fuel this campaign. Get them in little ads because they can. Get the ball a rolling, start um, advertising trials. Let Jamaicans anywhere they are in the world want to fly down to come to our trials because we're going to see Elaine line up against Shelly, line up against Sharika, line up against all the others to get three spots. This is not about four spots anymore. We have we have at least um, eight to ten women that can make that team and it's only three we need for individual come to the stadium for the jamaica trial to see which three will cross the line because nobody has a free ticket it's not like the world championship where you have a free ticket where if you win the year before you have a buy everybody will have to run and this is why i like the olympic trials because everybody has to lace up Elaine will have to lace up, Shelly Ann will have to lace up, Sharika, Kevona, the whole works, everybody will have. So start the campaign now, visit their training camps and do little videos of them and post them on social media or whatever and call it Road to Paris, Team Jamaica, Drifting into Paris. It's simple. Well, I think it's not late, but... It's not late. We're just in October. Start the campaign now. Get Jamaicans all around the world buzzing. All the Jamaicans in the diaspora, in Europe, get them ready. Let them say, boy, Paris looks like it's going to be hot. I am going to see Jamaica. Get the people in Paris, the Jamaicans in Paris ready. I am afraid of oh. what's going to happen too. Uh, because of what happening I'm, I'm afraid of what's going to happen to Jamaican shock and feel because the mo moment we stop having superstars we're going to realize that management was doing a poor job but i don't think we're going to stop having so i don't think we're going to stop having superstars we've been having superstars from 1948 the first time we went to the olympics and we continue especially with the women the women just keep going and they're even getting better we have a young bunch just in the wings waiting yeah but the, the problem i'm having hp is that i don't want a superstar name i need it to be monetized i need I, these, I need these persons to be able to say not only a gold medal but something of value and substance after mm -hmm, they finish mm -hmm. this career. And yep. I don't think we have, I don't think the association has seen that vision where that we need to make sure these athletes are making money because the product is there to sell. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can, you could, you could rent the stadium and sell $1.5 million tickets to an entertainment concert for one superstar or two superstars. And we have several superstars that are paid millions around the world, but we're not appreciating it. So my thing is, it's about nation building though. I don't think J3 alone would be able to even fix this because the nation itself takes our athletes for granted. Athletes will walk what? to the airport. 
they might not be they they alone will not be able to do this but remember they are the one leading track and field so they have to come up with these ideas and invite people into their boardroom and say come we need to have a discussion about track and field jamaica we need to have a serious um discussion about this brand because track and field jamaica is a brand I'll go micro and I, I like micro managing micro stuff when it comes on to microeconomics. I'll go micro. You see, if I get those corner shops being a part of these athletes success and we start growing it from there, I don't need a million dollars from the corner shop. I don't need a million dollars from Mr. Chin. I need a case of water. We need a tin of Gatorade and you'll recognize you'll be grateful for it and you start generating that buzz from where the athletes are. Athletes do have a responsibility too. As much as though you have J3A leading, the athletes plays a part in all this too. They have to understand that they have a part to play in all of this, in the changing of the guard, the changing of the concept that we have. Make this happen. Make it favorable. Because if I go and... If I decide, all right, we're doing drift to, to Paris and we go to Elite and we say, Elite, we need to take some footage. It might be a pushback. We go up NVP or we go racers and we say, we just need footage to just create a buzz, create an ad. Their first impression is, what am I getting from it? But, I'm not going to do it for free. But we're all getting something from it because this is now about track and field Jamaica. So at the end of the day, everyone, everybody wins. Everybody will benefit from as, it. As Jermaine says, we are, they lack vision. And, yes. And, and the, the thing is, this is, this is nothing new. This is nothing new. And it's very embarrassing right now to know that we, j don't even have an advertisement out talking about Paris. I'm not asking an everyday advertisement, just maybe one or two. Even I light in your track season, what's coming up, make people make plans for it. People that want to come to Jamaica, they need to start planning their vacation. You need to start putting stuff into place. When you look at as much as our track and field is not a household name in the US, but the moment Diamond League to go to Haywood Field, everything is sold out in in Oregon. Oregon get expensive the moment the day the date has set. So hotel get expensive, ear fear to go there, everything. LA LA is having twenty twenty eight Olympics, and LA decide that they want track and field to be a household event they are already planning they already decide that this is a big deal for no us. that is what you call strategic planning uh, they st they come out they they're going to have their own diamond league in the u.s over different cities different states bringing people bringing the grassroots into play bringing a buzz because they want that event to happen jamaica need to start taking pages out of all of these countries books and make it happen if i i follow cricket and if you get a superstar out of india just one superstar out of india you're going to see how much money track and field generate just one superstar out of india out of one of those large nation in in Asia. And they're working and see on how much it. Money. They are working and they're, on it. And they're working on it to generate yes. one athlete to, mm -hmm, to be a nation, mm -hmm. to represent a nation there. And you'll see what happened and how much money is spent into track and field. And Jamaican don't realize it. We're not asking for a million dollars. If everybody contribute a dollar US or $10 US and say we're building something or building, a, you'll surprise what, what is built. We can't even bid for a, not, a, a championship because nobody have the vision to shut the stadium down and say, we're going to fix it so that we can bid for 24, 2025 season. Let us take track and field somewhere else because the season 
we know we're going to Paris. Nothing important. We can't take our child somewhere else. But we're we're looking forward to bringing world relays to Jamaica. We're bringing world championship to Jamaica. Why not? Why not have that vision? We have to create that vision now. We have to start planning strategically to get these get this running. Shelly's not Shelly will be what we call it soon in retirement. Elaine may be out of into retirement. Sharika going into retirement. We need well, we don't to want to call planning. we don't want to call retirement on them until they're no, ready. But no, I, I, no, I, I, no, I know where no, you're going. No, I know where you're going. No, I mean time frame four years from now it's retirement. People change lifestyles, want family, want yeah. this. We're moving away into a different era. Yeah, and indeed. This is for me, for me, this is the era of the last lovers of track and field we have. The rest yeah, of yeah. athletes coming up, they are not passionate. They don't have the passion and drive to to do what they love as much as all these mm -hmm. ladies or these gentlemen still have. So what's going to happen mm -hmm. when people think that I can do better? We have 16-year-olds getting 5 million sponsors. They're okay by the time they get to 24. They're like, I'm done with track and field. And we have to start all over. You start making all these analysis and start to put stuff into place that you can create the next Usain Bolt or create the next golden era because this is where our track and field is and this is the business of it. This, you start, exactly. You, you start negotiating with sponsorship for the next five years, not next year. Next year is already gone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We're going two, three, four more years down the line and start creating sponsorship. We're getting sponsorship for next 10 years. When you go into negotiations, you go into negotiations for not two years and three years. You're thinking your long term is long term now. We are, yeah. we're, we're far from it. And this is people sit and we, we, we hide so much behind of our performance over the years that we realize that management only persons who pay close attention to Jamaica track and field will realize like that. Like us, right? Yeah, that realize that there's so much that can be gained. A what, lot. Happened, what happened to sports tourism? What happened Talk to about that all the time. No, no, I mean, no. Carol Beckford, I have to call Carol Beckford name. Carol Beckford, she talk about this so many times over and over and over. I, we are the vision the vision we we lack HV, we lack the vision we had the opportunity to study in the u.s it's not cheap here even for united states citizens it's not cheap here you have people you need to create a system j need to create a system i i saw isa went went now and trying to put rules and regulations in to say only three persons from here can compete in champs don't do that we're we need to create a system that we want everybody to come into Jamaica. To come here, to yes. Don't yes. try to stop what is going to be your blessing. Yeah. Because if I live in the US and I have kids here, they're going to university in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, when university is done in Jamaica, they still can come back to the US with their same credential. Everything is the same thing and even a little bit better. So it's something to look at. Track and field, it's a it's it's a business. You start to invest. I think NVP does it very well. I have these athletes from dif different parts of the world that comes in and train here. We need to start looking to it and invest in it a little bit more. Bring persons here to appreciate what it is. Get the, get the coaching that is here. The education mm -hmm. is here. Create a lifestyle that is here. Um, you're doing a tour and you say, we're going up where Usain Bolt used to, to train. We're going up Usain Bolt statue. We're going up Asafa statue. We need to put these little things in place to make it work. So with that said, do you agree that a formal training is important? Do you agree or disagree? H HB, you know, I, I beg to differ still because we have formal training in different sectors of sectors and different parts of the world and we will not get that position 
they will still overlook us. They will still think that we're not qualified. We could have gone to school for all the masters and all well, the what, Well, what and... we're going to do, because we have the formal training, what we are going to do is give them the information. We're going to give the information for free and hoping that when they watch a program like this, they will it will get somewhere in their head and they're like, okay, so we need to turn around how we do things. If you're not going to employ us to do the job, then we're just going to talk about it and give it to them. I'll give for, them for free. Yeah, I'll give them for free because at the end of the day, Jamaica wins. I'm a Jamaican, so Jamaica would win. So with that said, people, um, we're quickly going to, a lot of people have asked me, and I'm sure they've asked Xavier, if you were to run a sport organization, how would you run it? And Xavier and I, we came up with doing a pitch. So Xavier is going to pitch how he would run his organization. And then I'm going to pitch mine. We're just going to do it quickly. And then I'm going to pitch for us to close. So go ahead, Xavier. All right, Adri, putting me on the spot. Um, I would run it like any organization. Um, it's, it's not one person making the decision, that's for sure. Um, the head of my organization, the first thing we, we're going to sit down, we need a project manager because everything for me is, is project. We need to connect the dots. Um, HB, I think formal education and experience do, do coincide. We have to, to have a mixture of both because I think persons freshly with formal education and lack experience sometimes doesn't work out right. So it's a mixture of both. I will definitely have a mixture of both. I... For a track and field organization, the most important part of it is the athletes must realize that they are they are the product and they're going to make sure they market themselves the right way. And I'll provide them with the resources to market themselves the right way. It's for profit, but minimal profit for persons within the organization. The persons who get pay is the persons the athletes, majority of the money would be passed on to the athletes, um, development and lifestyle. Um, the vision, HB, you have me on the spot because I'll go on and on. I'm all no, over no, the you're fine. You're fine. You have a, you have one minute to go. I have one minute to go. <laughs> yeah, um, it's just you know, just briefly. Uh, uh, okay. It's it's building a relationship. Um, it's building a relationship. And for me, it's it's to run the organization, I will do it very simple at zero budget. I will get everybody in involved. If it's community-based, the community will be involved and we build the community along as building building the organization. So it's 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 integrating social development with organization, which is very important to me. So I think that's pretty much it for me though. Okay. Okay. Um, well, for me, if I'm running a sport organization, which I plan to do first, um, of course, I understand and respect that and accept that sport is a business. Sport is a career. Okay. The first thing that I would do is I would, uh, um, as we talk about earlier, Policies and procedures. I must have clear and concise policies and procedures in place. Secondly, clear or clearly written job descriptions. Job descriptions must be clear. Next, I would install effective, um, I would install an effective and efficient team of people who understand the core management functions, which are the functions that we just talked about. You must be able to understand and execute planning, organizing, leading, evaluating, and uh, finding the right fit for those job would be very important. So we're talking about the project manager, general manager, finance manager, marketing and events manager, and a whole lot more. Next, this person or myself, 
must be passionate about track and field. You must have some amount of passion for your organization or the the um the type of organization that you're going into. It doesn't make sense. You say, okay, I'm going to start a food organization and you have no passion for food. Have a passion for the type of organization that you want to lead and make it happen. Another thing that I'm very, very big on is accountability, accountability, accountability. All leaders and managers will be held accountable for their portfolio. Whether you are friends or family, you will be held accountable for your portfolio. Next, organization rules, and Davian and I, we talked about this earlier, organization rules will not be manipulated to suit one person and not suit another person. If I'm going to bend the rule for Xavier and I'm going to bend the rule for Sandy British, that's how it is going to go in order to have fair play. Next, effective communication. Regular meetings, seminars, workshop training is a must because at the end of the day, we want to achieve um, we want to achieve the association goals. Next thing is self-care. I love self-care. And when you have people working for you, self-care is a must. So we're going to be doing a lot of social stuff, um, building activities. We're going to go out together. We're going to party together. We're going to line together. We're going to go on fun days together because this is how you get, you empower, you... Um, motivate people by doing stuff with them. The next thing is that um, must understand that the most important asset to the organization is the athletes. That's the most important um, asset. The money and the building and all of those things, not important if there are no athletes. I know countries that have to be competing for another country because their country is not a member of the IOC. And in order to compete at the Olympics, your country must be a member of the IOC. And this is because they do not have the athletes to form an association. So athletes have to go elsewhere in order. So without the athletes, your organization, it doesn't make sense. And the next thing is I have is nobody is more important than the next person. No staff is more important. No staff is more, more important. So those are some of the things that I would implement in order to run my organization. And of course, another thing that I have that I've said it to some people and they think that I'm crazy everybody will be getting the same salary from the CEO come all the way down will be paid the same salary. I've said it to some people and they said it's crazy, but so that's how I would run my organization. And um, Xavier, I give you your last word before we close. Okay. Your thoughts, though, on on how I would run my organization? Well, I would I would be a part of the organization if I'm getting CEO pay. Okay. So everybody getting CEO pay, right? Everybody getting the same pay. Everybody. No, no, I, I said I, CEO pay. I did not say CEO pay. I said all of us will be getting this from myself as the founder and the CEO. All of us down to the person who will be taking out the trash, everybody. And the thing is that it will be a nonprofit organization. So it's not for profit, it's for uh it's nonprofit. So all of us will be getting the same salary. Now there's a catch to it. If you are not pulling your weight, then you have to go. So, and it is not autocratic. It's not autocratic. It is, it is democratic because I'm giving you, I am giving you an option or I am giving you the option to sell yourself and to earn your keep. And listen, if I am the founder and you and I are earning the same salary, why wouldn't you want to do your job? So your thoughts and my management style. 
your management style part of it is autocratic you say you got to go no no, no, no <laughs> i'm just joking no but Vivian, in any organization if you're not doing what your portfolio said why you keep got to that go person? yeah you have to go um accountab to go. accountability and transparency there you go and, and that's what it is um my few 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 sentiments is that um as you said some formal learning must take place or some formal training must take place um i am um, of the concept of the concept that um a mixture of both should work and coincide to connect the dots um i'll put it out there for j3 is that people are watching we're watching we're analyzing and believe mm -hmm. you me there's a, and there we a lot can of, help if you need uh, our help we can help we can help and not even us alone you have persons out there with creative minds creative yeah. way of doing stuff um, um you must remember that there are a lot of sports program out there and sports masters program out there that your 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 association is being watched keenly and this is because we produce superstars and when people start to evaluate it, you realize that stuff is going wrong. And that's what happened now, because we start taking a keen look because we're saying, how can this organization that is not being run efficiently produce so many superstars? Imagine if you could just get it right. Run it efficiently, you would create two or three more you see in both. And I'm not talking about world records here. We're talking about earning potential. We need for you to be able to create a system that will facilitate our athletes and persons within the industry or within the sport to maximize their earning power. Because at the end of the day, going to championship does not feed people, family, or buy houses or take care of their lifestyle. And you have the platform, you have the capabilities to use my favorite word, Sandy British, manipulate the system for our athletes and our supporting staffs to maximize their earnings. And that's all I want for you to maximize the earning and stop treating it as a sport. It's a business. But it is clear that it is no longer amateur. It's no longer amateur. It's a professional. And it's no this longer is what amateur. I, this is what I always said. And I said it on my I said it on our podcast that, that we host that Puma paid say Puma paid HP five thousand dollars for five years. We must be able to understand the time value of money. By the time five years come, that money doesn't value anything to HP, teacher athletes. Yes, indeed. That's one. Puma could not pay for an advertisement in world championship, but they sponsor you for $5,000, which an advertisement slot is worth $10 million. Why can't the athlete get more money? And I'm going to say this, and this is my thing. I think Puma... And our major sponsors has done injustice to our sport. Our major sponsors are doing injustice to our sports because they are shortchanging our athletes because they can pay way more. And that's no, my but take. no, but the thing is that you know you can't even blame Puma because if you don't know what you are worth, and I come to you and you're selling something, and I said, okay, Xavier, sell me this for a dollar. In my mind, I know that it costs five dollars but you don't know and you accept because remember you know it is an exchange we are doing and if i offer you a dollar and you said yes i'll take it what am i doing wrong it's a transaction we are doing and you agree to it so it's not really so much on them but is on us as in our federation who is not um HB. educating HB, it's not and the, being it's, the middleman between our athletes and 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 so forth I, I'll, I'll close on this and this is this is something that um i will close on you say that it's not puma or not the major sponsor i'll use puma as an example not calling out puma 
major sponsor, you have two track athletes, two different country, two different contracts. But you agree to it. You remember, you know, Puma is doing a business, and we, we, you have to look at it. We can't knock the businessman for okay. doing what he's supposed. It's good to. business. He's, yes, it's he's good doing business. a business. It's good business. So if I am over here and you are over, over there, and Puma call me tomorrow and say, um, Heather, I like your content, and I'm going to give you two dollars every week. I'm going to give you two dollars and i said yes i will accept it and he come to you over there with two dollars and you say no my content worth ten dollars i want ten dollars and if he decide to give you ten dollars and give me two he did not do anything wrong i accepted the deal and that's, that's how business and that's how business go he's not there to come and say oh you you are valued ten dollars so i'm going to give no you okay. need to know what you worth and me, ask me. for that. But in the comment section, I think I have um, a staff for my organization. Latoya Clark's um, likes the same pay thing. So you see, <laughs> my organization is going to be the first organization in the world where from the CEO all the way down will be getting the same salary. Yes. I'm going to be the first organization to do that. The same salary, everybody across the board. But if I cannot hold you accountable for your portfolio, you have to go and your contract will state that if you're not doing your work, then you have to go. So you see, I'm a very nice boss. Stand the British, my producer, so, big up you're yourself. So, you're, you're so an autocratic. With same no, pay. no, it's no, <laughs> no, but same thing. It's not autocratic. No. I'm actually doing can you see what I'm doing already? I am motivating. No, who would not be motivated to work with a company where they and their CEO earning the same salary? Who wouldn't want that? Tell me. Tell me. Uh, Everybody uh, would want I'm that. I'm I'm go I'm gonna I'm gonna do my research and get back to you. I would want that even because I'm sure the CEO is not going to pay himself ten dollars. So you that's see? what I said. It's, it's CEO pay we get in. So I don't mind. I don't I, in that organization. I don't mind raking up the yard and sweep the office. Same pay, same pay all across <laughs> the board. Hey Dave, how are you? Dave is here. And I just want to thank everyone who came out tonight to be a part of us this discussion because we need to be having these discussions. We need to be talking about managing a po um, sport organization. What, and these are not our words, is what is out there. Management um, dictates that we plan, we organize, we lead, and we evaluate. Those are not our words. It is what we are supposed to be doing. So thank you guys for being here. Latoya, thank you for being here. Dave Graham is agreeing with me. I don't know if it's same same pay. No, it don't, it don't agree with you with same pay. Oh, you don't <laughs> agree with me. I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't see the don't. I was trying to overlook the don't. But, but you see, Dave, it is a strategy. You now, what I'm doing, when I say same pay for all of us, what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to let my staff know or my employees know that They're nobody right is above anybody in my organization. And I will also want them to know that their value is adding to the organization. So if I am paying you the same pay that I am getting and you don't want it, I'm not saying anybody should do it. I don't think anybody should do it, but that is what I have on my business plan that we all, so if it's $100 a week, me, I get the same $100 and the documentation will be there when I'm audited to show that my pay is not 150 and yours is 100. We all will get the same pay but because we have to be creative we're in a new era we have to and i don't want to have a high staff turnover i'm not saying people can't move on but i want when you come through the doors to work with my organization you feel as if you are a part of something so thank you guys for being here and again i just want to wish um three times olympian ruth williams happy birthday Simpson. A happy, happy birthday. Come on, Xavier. Wish Auntie Ruth happy birthday. She's a three-time Olympian. Auntie Ruth, um, I, I will have to do a 
bit more research, but three time Olympian, I would like to wish you happy birthday from HP chat track. <laughs> thank you thank you very much thank you very much and thank you all for being here and guys i don't say this enough because i keep forgetting and my producer is on my back remember please to subscribe to like and share the content please share the content because this is a kind of content that will help us as a country to to get to where we ought to be because we're a big thing in track and field. Please, please share, share. Okay, just before we go, Dave Graham is saying, okay, Dave said to pay them according. Okay, Xavier, and I'll let you read this one. Go ahead. And I, Dave, I like you. Pay them accordingly, but develop a reward and rec recognition program that allows to feel that they are a key part of the organization. Well, that's that's true, Dave. Let me answer for you, HV. That's true, but that's a system that is, has been employed over the years in many organizations. What HP is trying to say is that we, she want to be... We, please to say we. <laughs> <laughs> we want to, Okay, we want to be, let me tell you, we want to be cutting edge. We want to be in an... In, we want to create something that people look up on and be we want to be that organization that students will study and say how did they make this work we how want this, to be we want to be the pioneer of something you have so many pioneers out there so we want to be the pioneer of this because i don't know of any organization where from the ceo down is getting the same salary so we want to be the pioneer for this and we are going to make it happen so th that is really the aim we want to be the pioneer of something and also we want our staff to feel as if they want to be a part of something and i do respect that comment Dave. but i've seen a lot of companies have um, this kind of system, but at the end of the day, not everybody is awarded something. The reward and recognition program they foster mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of stuff. Um, it it creates uh, how would I put it? It creates segregation sometimes. It separates people sometimes because some people are awarded and some people don't get anything, and it it, it is so hard to measure it who gets, who don't get, because if I give three people a portfolio and all three people do what they're supposed to do, do I give them the same reward? Do I give one a little bit more than the other? So it because I've been in an organization before and somebody was awarded and I wasn't, and I'm questioning myself, didn't I contribute for this year to the organization? How is it that I didn't get anything? So you know, that's a very famous one, but um, I like this one that I came up with. Um, a few people have said it's crazy. Xavier himself has said it's crazy. I've had other people saying no, but we will see. We will see when Once we I'm go back. Once I'm getting CEO pay. Yeah, we will see when <laughs> we go back in the boardroom. So you see, I'm not um, autocratic at all because I listen to my people. I listen to my people. So, guys, thank you very much. Oh, my God, two hours. Thank, thank you, you very much for having me, HV. Anytime, anytime. It and, was. And people, this is my first time doing a, a live show. So and you did well. You did well. You did no, well. I you tried. speak with, yes, you speak with great knowledge. And I'm sure, and I hope the audience take away something from what we spoke about and people who will be watching i hope the our organization that governs track and field and not just track and field but sport in jamaica will look at this and take something from it and let us just move forward as a country and do bigger and better things as a professional because sport is no longer amateur amateur just to get, yeah just the to get business. that right Yes. So thank you guys for being here. Facebook, YouTube, thank you all um, for being here. Jeannie Green, thank you for being here. Dave, 
all the others. And Latoya, big up yourself. Thank you all for being here. I saw Kino earlier. Everybody who tuned in, thank you very much for hanging out with us tonight. And I hope you learned something. And join me next week when we will have a mouth-watering conversation when I will have Dr. Renee Clark on talking about health and wellness in sport. Dr. Renee Clark and her husband, Kevin Clark. Thank you guys for being here. As I always say, one Jamaica. We're out. Peace. Right. Thank you. Right.